The Cabo de Hornos, one of the world's finest research vessels, today sails the southern seas. But just before its scheduled launch in February 2010, the ship risked being lost forever when an earthquake triggered a massive tsunami that threw the 2,000-ton vessel up onto the beach. A year later, the ship was saved by machines like this, the state-of-the-art SPMT transport trailers of a Dutch salvage company whose offices stay open 24 hours a day to respond to emergencies worldwide. The Cabo de Hornos is the pride of Chile's Navy. It sails the Pacific, carrying out precious research into the environment of the Antarctic. It was built over two years in the Asma shipyard in Talcahuano in Chile and cost a staggering 62 million US dollars. The ship was planned to have a top speed of 14.6 knots and today is one of the four most advanced research vessels in the world. It almost never sailed. The earthquake that struck Chile at 3.30 in the morning on the 27th of February 2010 lasted more than a minute and at 8.8 .8 on the Richter scale was the fifth most powerful ever recorded. More than 500 people died, and the aftershocks continued for months, devastating the Chilean economy. Although the Cabo de Hornos stood ready for the official launch due hours later, there would be no ceremony that day. The earthquake caused a two and a half meter high tsunami that devastated the towns of Valparaiso and Talcahuano, throwing boats onto the roads and beaches. The Cabo de Hornos was thrown onto the beach hundreds of meters beyond the dock it was standing on. The devastation was total. And that beach, it was a black beach. There was old containers there, there were there was a part of a building washed up on that beach. There were the carcasses of dead sea lions. There was all kinds of debris around the ship. It was one big mess. So this is one, one wheel bogey, and we have one bogey line. That's how we land it. So on this line, one bogey line, we can put 48 tons on. And then we, that means that we have to inflate the, inflate the tires up to 15 bar air pressure. And I must say that out of 10 cases, 80% 80 80 uh, you go back home immediately and on the 20% you're the successful winners. The salvage company Mahmoud Salvage is based in Shidam in the Netherlands and landed the contract to move the Cabo de Hornos back to the sea. First a few guys did an inspection and they made the proposal for a contract for, um, for the plan. Then uh, the contract was awarded to us and I came there, I think it was November 2010. We came there uh, to execute the plan. It took 10 months to agree on a salvage solution that would allow the ship to be delicately refloated for future use. Karel van Hof made his way out to Chile and the port of Talcahuano in November 2010. Uh, the situation was one big mess. The village where the yard was next to, there were cars everywhere on the roads, a lot of buildings were collapsed, there were ships scattered around on the roads, and the yard itself was also a big mess. There were the, the floating docks, they were everywhere, they were partly sunk, a lot of buildings were collapsed, there were still cars upside down everywhere. The ship was lifted a few days prior to the launch, and it, was, it ended up on a beach where the yard used to drop their blasting grid.
Mammut Salvage is an offshoot of the far bigger Mammut Heavy Lift Company, based here in Schiedam, near Rotterdam, Netherlands. The company's claim to fame was the raising of the Russian nuclear submarine Kursk, which had sunk in the Arctic with a crew of 118 on board in the year 2000. Mammut, together with another Dutch salvage giant, Smeet Salvage, beat the Arctic climate to lift the Kursk submarine from the floor of the Barents Sea. The then owners of Mammut, Franz and Jan van Zoymeren, persuaded the Russian government that their lifting techniques using strand jacks, a hydraulic compensation system for the waves, and specially designed plugs that opened when pulled, could lift the submarine off the seafloor. It was a radically novel solution, suited to lifting the nuclear submarine still loaded with live torpedoes. Smith Salvage, a giant in the salvage business, supplied the massive barge and the cutting wire to remove the nose of the submarine where the torpedo compartment was located. Together, the Dutch salvers braved the winter storms and brought the Kursk back to Murmansk, together with its tragic cargo of submariners. After Kursk, Mammut made a name for itself by combining heavy lift technologies with ship salvage. It is a cutthroat business, fraught with legal and technical challenges. So then the first thing is to, and that's not a salvage master's job, but that's the commercial side of, of the office, establish contract, contact with, uh, with the owners. Uh, therefore you have brokers or you sometimes have direct access to uh, an operations manager who's uh, dealing with the case. Mammut Managing Director Fokker Ringesma is responsible for persuading companies to let Mammut do the job. Yeah, the moment you receive the call, um, usually it comes in through local port authorities, through local agents or through the ship owner themselves. But mainly the, the ship owner themselves, they dig into uh, also a, a legal uh, protection. Um, so the, the, the first call comes usually comes in through um, a, a friendly agent or subcontractor in, in that particular country. Mammut Salvage is located in Shidam, close to the main Mammut Tower. And here, the salvage masters and naval architects that put together the salvage plans store a range of maritime salvage equipment. Managing Director Fokker Ringesma leads a team of marine architects and salvage masters with decades of experience on the most extreme salvages. Not only the Kursk, but the Agullus in South Africa and the ongoing Baltic Ace recovery in the North Sea. Mammoth's experience with heavy lift gave it the edge over its competitors when bidding for the job in Chile, as the ship was not damaged, just a long way from its natural habitat, the sea. It had been lifted by Mother Nature and now would have to be lifted by man. We respect each other and um, we know that only one can, uh, can secure the job. And, uh, well, you fight till the bitter end and after that, you shake hand with a successful uh, winner of the contract. You wish him luck, and you offer uh, your sometimes your, your subcontracting services to him, and then you go back home. The Cabo de Hornos is an advanced oceanographic and fisheries research vessel that is 74 meters long, with a molded breadth of 16.6 .6 meters. It has an operating draft of 5.4 meters, and when fully equipped weighs over 3,000 tons. At the time of launch, it weighed 2,000 tons and was empty of all equipment. Although the tsunami literally lifted it out of the dock where it was ready for launch and dropped it onto a sandy beach nearby, the structure was still essentially intact. All about it lay devastation. 
There were a lot of buildings were torn down in the village. They told me it was 8.8 .8 on the Richter scale. So that's quite heavy and there was so the damage was destructive. Everything was torn down in the village. The roads were just washed away. There was a big stadium which was just cracked in half. There was a big gap in the middle. It, the damage was enormous. The harbour area that Karol van Hof found when he arrived was covered in the remains of collapsed buildings. And before any work could begin, these had to be cleared. In order to refloat the sophisticated research vessel Cabo de Hornos from the point on the sandy beach where the tsunami had dropped it, several approaches had been discussed during the salvage planning phases. The simplest would have been to use skid shoes to drag the ship down to the water. Skid shoes are hydraulically powered brackets that move forward along a line of rails and hook into one steel sleeper at a time and then pull forward or push back. Here they are seen in action in another context, during the jumboization of a cruise liner in a shipyard in Palermo, Italy. The original plan was, because it was a new built vessel, we had to take a uh, treater with great care. The original plan was to lift her up, put her on skid tracks and skid her back into the water. But as soon as we came there and reassessed the situation, we found that uh, we better change the plan to put her on SPMTs, which are the modular transporters, and drive her uh, back onto a barge and refloat her in a sheltered uh, dry dock so we were independent of the weather. And that was the plan we uh, put forward to the yard. We proposed it to them. The terrain was simply too uneven for the simplest solution, so the Mammoth Salvers called in the heavy lift engineers who had an ace up their sleeve. Massive civil engineering work began to prepare the salvage of one of Chile's most costly marine investments. The SPMT is the world's most versatile heavy transport system. We changed from the system because the schedule needs a very straight uh, track and there was too much debris and containers and rocks in the, in the way. And we found that for this particular case, the SPMTs were a better solution. It was also some kind of a gut feeling, more or less. Well, from this uh, control panel, uh, we can uh, move uh, one SPMT or up to 500 lines SPMTs. Yeah, we drive now six lines SPMTs. And from here out, I can drive, uh, steer the whole system and drive the whole system, lift up the whole system and down, up and down. And put, and these are sort of uh, lot, lots of buttons what you do, what you, uh, where you can control the whole system with it. But uh, on the end, you're driving, that's only your left and right, forwards and backwards, and your lift system. The Mammoth engineers are specialized in lifting heavy objects. Here, during preparations for the Mammoth Open Day near Schiedam in the Netherlands, they show off some of the equipment to their fans from all over the world. The main mover in the Mammoth world is the strand jack. This is a hydraulic pulley that moves a steel cable grabber up and down, pulling up dozens of cables by a few centimeters at a time, distributing the load among many cables and many strand jacks. Here in the Mammoth Yards, workers are refurbishing and repairing used strand jacks ready for their next mission. Mammoth also owns some of the largest mobile cranes in the world. And this is one of Europe's largest. The new generation platform containerized twin ring crane is a new concept of crane that can be carried around the world in containers that are then used as ballast.
Above all, Mammut owns and operates hundreds of the most versatile transport in the world, the SPMT, the self-propelled modular transporter. Here in Shidam, Michel Pex is one of Mammut's most experienced SPMT operators. The SPMT was Mammut's solution to saving the Cabo de Hornos research ship. Here you can see uh, which kind of direction you can do in a normal steer, diagonal steer, uh, front, the steering point on the front, on the end, and you can do a circle drive. So that means exactly the middle of the trailer stays in the middle where it is, and then it turns 360 or how many, how many you want to turn around. So you can drive from this point here, I can drive 180 degrees from here, I can turn it around or I can drive 90 degrees full load. The SPMT is actually an assembly of separate axles, each of which can operate either independently or in unison. The operator enthusiastically shows off the characteristics of an SPMT. With this in here, this, there is an hydraulic cylinder, and with this hydraulic cylinder, we bring the oil in or we take the oil out from out of the control power pack and we can lift up the trailer from uh, 1.2 meters to 1.8 meters. Those four bogies are controlled out of these levers. I can do it by hand, always. Always in emergency operation we can do everything by hand, but we do it from out of the control box and then the computer send the signals to all valve blocks one by one. We have here four steering pistons and there is a, there's a, um, uh, there's a wheel in, it goes in here, connected to the button and then the, the steering pistons will change from the direction and takes the wheel also with him. So it's like a slew ring, like a crane. It's the same, but then smaller size like this. The Mammoth SPMT can swivel on itself and switch a load around, just as it can move in any direction with the wheels all in parallel. These units can also be attached together to make one massive moving flatbed. Those are the connecting poles, connecting pin to put the next to, uh, trailer on it, on the front. And then here we connect all the hoses for to give the oil, the next uh, trailer also the oil and the power and the data what we need. They are capable of rising by 60 centimeters to engage any loads that are suspended above ground and lower them to be able to move them. A six-axle line trailer has a 280-ton capacity. The PPU power pack is the control unit and can move many axle lines and control the hydraulics. All the movements are controlled via electrohydraulic command that ends in the operator's remote control pack. but you can do maximum 40 axle lines on one PPU and that depends on the oil to feed up the cylinders. Power pack, this is uh, like this, this you can do, uh, we can do 40 axle lines on. And it doesn't matter where the axle lines are. So when we need more than 40 axle lines, you need another PPU. But we can build it up till 500 axle lines where you want. But then you need a certain amount of PPUs for your, for your hydraulic system. So there's, uh, 850 liters hydraulic oil in the PPU. We started with the project, we started with the, the design of the, the, the track back to the, to the dock and then we start filling in all the gaps. We had to tear, tear down a building for example to make some space and as soon as we got that everything outlined 
we start filling in the gaps, deciding what equipment we needed. And then we bring in the equipment. So that took several weeks after the project started, more or less. Some of the SPMTs came from Singapore, other ones came from the States, from Europe. They were brought in from all over the world. However, getting the 2,000 ton hulk to the port across the uneven terrain of the sandy beach was going to be a major problem, even with the versatile SPMTs. Since the sea was not accessible for skid shoes in the direction of the bow, and the dock was higher than the sand beach where the ship was resting, the salvers decided they would build a ramp to take the SPMTs carrying the ship to a barge floating in the dock. It wasn't really on its side, it was like on maximum uh, 10 degrees uh, listing, so that's not really considered on its side. But it was actually standing right up there and we, it was taken in the, in the execution that we first we jacked her up and then we jacked one side up more than the other side, so we got it completely straight up. And then uh, we lifted the rest by the SPMTs because they also have some lifting capacity and then we drove the whole combination back onto the barge. The team began working on clearing the area, laying down steel sheeting to smooth the work surface and building a flat ramp over which the transports could move smoothly, while other contractors began preparing the ship for the lift. First we draw out the path, which, uh, which was our plan with the SPMTs because there was also a height difference between where the ship was resting and the dock height. So we, we measured it very accurately and made the path because we can maximum be on a four degree slope. And that's why we had to tear down one of the buildings as well, because the building was in the path of the SPMT. So we tore it down and with a huge civil works, we also made a, a dam around the ship and uh, erased the, the level there for the, for the sand so we could uh, otherwise we couldn't reach the, the four degree slope we were planning to make. Within a few weeks, the civil engineering pieces of work had been done and the true heavy lift salvage work could begin. The Cabo de Hornos research vessel had not moved a single inch during the time it took for the salvage crews to prepare the terrain to get her back into the sea. The whole area had to be cleared of debris first, leveled and prepared for the massive move. Debris was removed by crane, digger and truck so as to eliminate any obstacle to the ship's smooth movement from its resting place back to the dock. It wasn't completely finished yet, so a lot of, for example, the piping in the interior in the engine wasn't completely finished. So prior to the refloat, we had to uh, check all the piping, see if everything was shut off, closed off, all the valves were closed off. Uh, the superstructure, for example, wasn't built yet. It was only in the outline of superstructure, but the whole flooring wasn't in, all the staircases weren't in, there was no electricity in the ship. So everything, we had to always carry our, our torch lights with us. And the ship itself uh, had quite some damage because before she ended up on the beach, she hit some, some buildings and there was a lot of wear and tear on the sides, scratches, dents, etc. The brackets were solidly welded to the side of the ship's hull and the bond between them and the steel would have to carry the whole weight of the ship as it was being carried by the mobile platforms. The ship was like an injured patient being carried by the shoulders. Once the brackets were on and the ramp was ready, it was time to bring in the SPMTs. The 
the original plan was to lift the, to drive the, to jack it up, drive the SPMTs underneath and drive the combination back onto the barge. But then we found out that we run into problems with stability because you have quite a high load, which is quite narrow. So we decided to change the system and jack it up uh, not as high as originally anticipated, weld the big triangles to the side and drive the SPMTs underneath. So our combination will be lower and wider, which is of course good for stability. SPMTs are designed to be able to fit into a maritime container. Here at the Schiedam Yards in the Netherlands, they are piled up, ready to be shipped to any salvage operation across the globe. Massive cranes are used to unload and load them to be taken down to the docks at a moment's notice. In fact, the Mahmoud personnel are constantly preparing and repairing machinery so that they can be moved to an incident at any time. So it, it's a parallel track for getting commercially the, your contract secured and operationally get your equipment and personnel as soon as possible on site. Uh, to get your equipment on site is with these boxes, which we have all pre-packed with packing lists, all known with the customs already. So it's just a matter of sending this code to the dispatcher and they can have it in, in three, four hours on a plane en route. Actually, we, we just came there first with a, a few guys just to reassess the situation and then we didn't have any material with us. As soon as we draw the plan and everything got its form, we uh, brought all the SPMTs, the ballast pumps, we brought the, uh, the jacks to jack her up, all the ramps. That was all brought uh, back to Chile as soon as the plan was finished. The SPMTs were sent to Chile in containers from all over the world. As they were unloaded one by one, they were put through their paces to make sure they worked. Once the axle lines required were put together with their flat top, they were ready to lift the massive load. It is the most flexible form of transport available to the heavy lift operations. We used uh, 84 axle lines, so 84 axes, with four power packs. And I believe we had uh, 16 jacks of 200 tons, something like that. So it was quite a lot of equipment. It was about uh, 32 containers. When they arrived, they were tested and put to work. The SPMTs were built up with bollards and wooden blocks to reach close to the height of each individual bracket. The fit had to be perfect to make the ride smooth and safe. Then the SPMTs were raised hydraulically until the blocks engaged with the brackets. And then slightly higher still, so that each bracket now bore the load of the ship and rested perfectly on the transports. The ship's keel rose off the sandy beach. The 2,000 tons of the ship rested on the 84 axle lines and their flat tops, which took the weight on their hydraulic suspensions and were ready to roll. Yeah, we always say, I have to say, I'm not really an expert on SPMTs because that's normally outside my work scope. But this was the first time I worked with them. And we used to say, that's what I learned, maximum about 25 tons per axle line. And this ended up around 17 tons per axle line. While the SPMTs were being positioned, diggers and bulldozers moved the sand from under the ship so as to increase the free space under the keel and positioned steel plates on the ramp 
to ensure perfect traction for the SPMT transporters as they move towards the dock. In order to get the ship onto the ramp, the salvers needed to give enough space under the ship for it to be tilted upwards by four degrees. The SPMTs were linked together in 84 axle lines, 42 on either side, nearly 4,000 tons load capacity. Now it was time to begin moving the ship. The four diesel power packs provided enough power to drive up the ramp with ease. On the 26th of January 2011, the 84 axle lines moved in unison under the watchful eyes of the operators. We drove her up the slope, over the side of the dock, and then we drove her onto the floating barge, which then the whole combination was lowered. The amazing maneuverability of the SPMTs is demonstrated in the Shidam yards and was applied in the Chilean port too. Moving the ship up the ramp was relatively straightforward under the control of a single operator who maneuvered the 84 axle lines and four power units. By the time the SPMTs bearing the ship got to the edge of the dock, the real skills of the driver could be shown off. The barge was, I believe it was a 330 foot barge. It came from the, from the east coast of the state, so we brought it all the way to the Panama gates, to the Panama locks, all the way down to Chile. And the ballast capacity was more than sufficient for a, for a vessel like this. Those barges are typically used for transport of offshore structures, etc., and they're way heavier than this one was. The ship and SPMT combination reached the edge of the dock the day after the move began. In the meantime, the dry dock was filled with seawater and the gates open. A massive barge, the Marmac 300, which was 87 meters long, 30.5 meters wide and 6 meters deep, previously used in the offshore industry and able to carry the full weight of the Cabo de Hornos research ship, had been tugged all the way from North America and down the whole coast of the South American continent. On the 27th of January 2011, it was towed into position inside the flooded dry dock of the Talcahuano construction yard and prepared to receive the 2,000 tons of the Cabo de Hornos research vessel. Once in position, the barge was securely moored and pumped dry to give it as much buoyancy as possible to take the weight of the ship. There's one driver for the SPMTs. He controls uh, the whole combination. And he can either carousel it, rotate it, or he can drive it. He, he decides where the combination is going. The next day, the ship was driven over ramps onto the barge an even more delicate operation for the driver. Any error could tip the ship on its side and the barge was an unstable surface onto which to drive the units. The barge was pumped constantly to keep it afloat under the weight of the rescued vessel. The ship was about 2,000 tons uh, weight. It was a casco, she wasn't really fully built, so not all the equipment was there. Uh, and. For example, the superstructure wasn't finished yet, so it was only the steel casco, and that was about 2,000 tons. 74 meters in length, about almost 16 meters wide. The margin for error was a matter of centimeters. The ship had not only to be slipped down onto the barge, but also turned through 90 degrees to remain parallel with the dock and in the center of the barge. But there's guys everywhere with uh, radios telling what to do. Uh, you have to imagine, it goes very slowly. It's not like a 50 km per hour operation. It goes really step by step. So the guys on one side tells him, hey, you can, here you have a meter left, so he knows that, and he can adjust his course for that. The barge fitted perfectly into the dock and the ship on the barge. But the most critical element for floating the ship was the depth of the dock. We found out that uh, the most critical dimension of the dry dock was the water level. 
because it had to accommodate uh, the dock blocks, the barge, the cribbing in between the ship and the barge, and the ship free flowing itself. That was the critical dimension. The width and the length of the dry dock, they were more than sufficient for this. It took the whole day to position the ship on the barge, swiveling the 2,000 ton vessel through 90 degrees using the unique turning capacity and versatility of the SPMTs. The SPMT driver swiveled the axles. Once perfectly positioned in the center of the barge, the hydraulic suspension of the SPMTs could be lowered, and once again, the massive 2,000 ton research ship could rest on its keel. Slowly but surely, without damaging the ship, the supports were removed from the SPMTs, and then, eventually, the transporters themselves were maneuvered one by one around the ship's hull and off the barge onto dry land. We, drive, we drove it onto the barge, positioned it in the right spot. There we lowered it back onto the deck of the barge. We took the SPMTs off. Uh, we had to cut off the triangles as well. So, because after the refloat, we have to moor it alongside the key. So we, we, uh, in the overnight, we cut off the triangles. One by one, the 10 brackets, five for each side, were removed and the dry dock could be slowly emptied. We lowered the water level in the dock. The barge was resting on its dock blocks. Then we opened all the manholes and uh, refilled the bar, uh, refilled the, the uh, dock again. So now the vessel was coming, was free floating away from the, from the barge. We opened the dock doors, she was towed out. And then we uh, closed the dock doors, emptied the, emptied the dock again, lowered the water level, so, and then we emptied the barge so she came floating up and there we had them separated. The complex operations of filling, emptying and refilling the dry dock were complete at last. The submersible barge waited at the bottom of the dock as the Cabo de Hornos began to float. On the 29th of January 2011, the dry dock where the Cabo de Hornos research vessel of the Chilean Navy rested was flooded. The barge that had supported her during the first hours of her return to the sea remained at the bottom of the dock, as slowly but surely the proud steel ship began to float. The, the atmosphere was great because we really, there was an atmosphere of, they realized that we came there to help them. And we got all cooperation from the yard, only the problems we run into was that it was very difficult to get our material because they were re literally rebuilding the whole country there. So things like, especially the steel was very difficult to get, the wood was difficult because we, had, we needed quite big amounts of everything and most of the steel was, just, was going into bridges, into other civil works. And that's, that, that took a lot of effort to get that arranged. The operation in Chile had lasted less than three months from beginning to end. We did the reflow, we did it more or less in a sheltered area because of the dry dock. So we were actually we were quite weather independent, but the weather was lovely. It was comparable to the Dutch or the British weather more or less. We have had some rain showers, but nothing out of the extraordinary. The Mammoth teams returned to their dockside base in Schiedam, near Rotterdam. I think we started, the first assessment team was about four or five people and then later on we came around 20. The moment the, the tender came out, then you indeed come up with, with a full throttle team, uh, including your engineers, and then you're going to work out uh, the details. The Netherlands is home to some of the largest salvage companies in the world and Mammut is just one of them. Rotterdam is the centre of the Netherlands shipping industry. Yeah, funny enough, I mean the salvage master has become more like the manager of the, the project. Uh, whereas when I started my career it was really the hands-on man um, leading the salvage team. Mammut brings together the expertise of heavy lift and salvage 
and in three major operations, the two worlds overlapped to make a rescue happen. The first of the series was salvaging the Kursk submarine, where Mammoth used massive strandjacks to raise the Soviet-era nuclear submarine from the floor of the Barents Sea, alongside giant of salvage, Smith Salvage, which provided the divers and cutting wire. Then in 2007 came the Agullus, pulled ashore from the breakwater of the South African port of East London. Strandjacks, cranes and SPMTs are the staple of Mammoth as much as of Mammoth salvage. Uh, I mean, with Mammoth, we have uh, in 52 countries in the world, we have our own offices and that's very helpful, of course. Mammoth enjoys a fan club of over 5,000 people willing to pay to visit the Mammoth Open Day at the training centre near the Shidam base. Here, the biggest mobile crane in Europe is set up near the Strandjack exhibit. It is able to extend the crane arm to 52 metres. and raise a load of 750 metric tons. Working with the world's most adventurous heavy lift company has helped Mammoth put forward innovative solutions for recovering wrecks and operating in the most complex situations. Ships run aground and sink all over the world in the most exotic and difficult situations. And anywhere where pulling power is needed, Mammoth can engineer the machines for each individual job. The ship was now completely outfitted with specialized laboratories and sophisticated marine and mapping equipment. In September 2015, a new earthquake struck Chile, this time 8.3 on the Richter scale and causing a new tsunami. The population and military set about clearing the beaches once again and returning displaced boats to the sea. This time, there was no need for the help of a heavy lift company. The rapid response people are on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week, ready to answer any calls for help anywhere in the world. The sun sets over the port of Shidam and the headquarters of Mammoth and Mammoth Salvage. The sea lane remains busy until well after dark, and as night falls, the lights of the Mammoth Tower go on. <laughs> 